welcome to Economic Solutions. Uh, this is our first program in a series uh, whereby we're going to be uh, showing certain facts about uh, economics as well as actions to take. My name is Leonard Zane. I'm here with Dr. Jan Martin of uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, even though he doesn't represent JPL uh, in this capacity. Not today. <laughs> Represents himself. Um, Jan is uh, a bachelor's uh, graduate from Caltech in electrical engineering and um, a PhD at Stanford. Uh, myself, I have an AB in international relations and economics from USC and a master's in business from USC. And also years ago, um, was uh, lucky enough to study uh, economics by uh, correspondence with um, Alan Greenspan. And we will be uh, talking a little bit about uh, Mr. Greenspan's role in some of the problems we have today. So uh, our goal here is going to be to be as factual and uh, fair and objective as we can. Um, we'll talk about what economic conditions are, and then we'll talk about uh, approaches to solve economic problems. Uh, one thing Jan and I were talking about just uh, earlier, uh, before the show started, was uh, to make it clear what a depression is. Well, a depression, first of all, is typically defined as a, an extended period where you have unemployment of 15% uh, or more. The Great Depression had 25% at its worst. And a depression, unlike a normal business cycle uh, where you have uh, rises and uh, recessions, a depression is a result of, uh, it's a bust that's caused by a boom. And we're going to look at what causes those booms, and then we're going to look at uh, how do you get out of the situation once you're in it. Now, we might indeed be in the beginning of a depression right now, and we'll be looking at uh, reasons for the people tell us that. So um, to start with, uh, let's look at the Great Depression um, in this display here. This describes unemployment uh, during the Great Depression of the 1930s. And Jan, you might want to explain a little bit about that. Right. Where we're, what we're starting off with is um, you can see that at the beginning, we were starting in the, um, in the late 20s. And unemployment is bouncing up and down. Uh, but never, not too high, in the order of the low 4% kind of range, which is reasonable. But now, all of a sudden, when we go hit the, um, the real Great Depression uh, in 1929 and subsequent years, the unemployment rises dramatically to, as we said before, 25%. Now, that's about as scary a number, I think, as if you're a, if you're a person out in the world, you know, trying to do work. Mm -hmm. uh, Three quarters of people are employed, but about a quarter of the people aren't, yeah. which is a huge number. So it actually starts, I think, Jan, what, around 1930 or so that the Depression starts? And That's then, right. Uh, you pointed out earlier that uh, we started to improve uh, at a certain point in the 1930s. Yes. As soon as, as Roosevelt gets elected right here in 1932, um, he starts to implement the New Deal, and, which is a large, large spending, uh, many spending bills. And uh, the other part that's important is his banking reform. So he does both of those things. And you can see that the unemployment starts to go down. It starts to go down rather dramatically. And what year is that? We're talking about the turnaround is about 1933, 34. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it jumps down, goes down fairly, fairly well, down to right here, which is 1937. And unfortunately, at this point, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, loses his nerve in a way and starts to try to balance the budget. He slashes the, uh, the programs, he increases taxes, and gets basically slapped upside the head by the economy, and the unemployment jumps from roughly 12% back up to 18% or so. Mm -hmm. And so then we're in real trouble. He, he, he wakes up at this point, reinstitutes the New Deal, increases spending by, by the government, and then the economy responds again, and the unemployment continues to drop. And it really, uh, ends though around 1940, right? In That's terms right. Of the, so it's a 10 year depression, even though there yes. was a slight rise. Uh, so that was certainly a very serious uh, and traumatic situation. Okay, um, we're going to look at the cause. In order to understand what's happening to us today, we, the Great Depression is a very good thing to look at uh, in terms of historical reference. So um, we talked about. Booms and busts 
a depression is caused by a boom, and we want to see what's behind a boom. What, what's yeah. different about a boom than simply uh, an economic upswing? That's part of the business cycle. Well, right. the Roaring Twenties were given that, that name, uh, not just because of the music and everything else, but because it was a very high energy time where people uh, were spending a lot, the economy was soaring, but their prices, the prices were rising very fast. One of the things we should look at is something that Alan Greenspan had recommended many years ago, a book that's very important in economic history in the United States. It's called Economics and the Public Welfare. It's written by Benjamin Anderson, who was economist at Chase Bank. And uh, this is a history from 1913 to 1946. And most of those years, he was there at Chase as uh, an economist. And mm -hmm. this is considered a classic book on what happened to America, um, how the Depression happened. Basically, what he says in this book, um, it was about uh, problems created by the Federal Reserve and gold uh, flowing into the United States that uh, gave us too much money and drove all these prices up and uh, eventually led to the crash. A second book um, that's more contemporary. And a bit more controversial. <laughs> and a bit more is uh, America's Great Depression by Professor Murray Rothbard. Uh, he um, is an economist who studied exactly what happened in the Great Depression. And he found, uh, by constructing all the data and putting the data together, that the Federal Reserve, which was created in 1913, December 1913, under Woodrow Wilson's administration, he found that the Federal Reserve from 1921 to 1929 increased the supply of money in the United States by 62%. That was unprecedented. Before that, uh, money was based on gold and the Federal Reserve couldn't just uh, manufacture money on a fractional uh, reserve system. Well, to be fair, it still was based on gold during this period. That's right. You have uh, had the ability, they had something like 35% uh, gold requirement for the money, but that meant 65% could be right. what's called fiat money uh, that is not one-on-one -on -one represented by gold. And we so, were still on the gold standard in a way in terms of the, the international economics. There was still this fixed exchange rate between correct. all the currencies in the world at that time. That's absolutely right. What was different, though, was the amount of um, monetary expansion that happened, 62% right. over those years. That's enormous. And this led to a lot of high prices, rising prices, soaring prices, not just the stock prices and securities. Everything was going up. Real estate was going up. Commodities were going up. Well, that's it, a boom. It did. It was a boom. This is what is a boom. It is fueled not just by a normal business swing. It's, right. This one's fueled by money, and there was tremendous money expansion going on here. Um, so now if we go beyond that, uh, there's the curve. Uh, we show it from 1922 to 1929, but you can see how steep that curve is in terms of the monetary expansion. It was unprecedented for the time. And keep in mind, I guess I should say right now, Jan, uh, it was Andrew Jackson who actually abolished the central bank uh, during his administration. And, and paid down the debt. And yeah, he actually paid off the America, the United it's the only States time I think it's debt. ever been paid off. Right, it's been completely paid off. And the country uh, seemed to survive quite well with no national debt. It survives, <laughs> it survives well, to be fair, with natural, <laughs> national, with a lot of debt and without debt. Yeah, without, I mean, without debt, either way. So anyway, um, uh, Central Bank was reinstated in late 1913, and this was their first um, onset of, of fueling the economy. They wanted to keep interest rates low. They created an awful lot of money, and uh, it drove a boom. Well, here we go. You can see what happened in terms of industrial production. And Jan, uh, you might want yeah. to explain here's, that. Um, here's, now it's, it's a little bit harder because this curve goes so far into the post or into the, the war period where things are really dramatic. But if you can take a look at the very beginning here, you can see how industrial production is actually increasing. This is the Roaring Twenties and we're actually getting, you know, we're actually getting an increase in production. It's not just 
you know, money is exploding and nothing's being produced. Things are really being produced this time. And, and industrial production is rising until right here, which is the crash in 1929. And then all of a sudden, things start going downhill. The, the degree of the amount of industrial production drops dramatically. Um, the index drops what a fa about 30 percent, roughly 30 or 40 percent. It's huge. It's a huge drop in production. And this is this I think is a product of bad policy. Mm -hmm. This is the Hoover administration, and mm -hmm. this is just, we're balancing the budget, you know, that's, we don't know what else to do, we're balancing the budget. And there, in here also, the Federal Reserve actually raises interest rates in order to defend the currency, because as I said before, we're still on the international gold standard. Right. So when the, when the pound was, was, was basically pushed off the, na the gold standard in 1931, the dollar was attacked right after that. Right. And so we had to defend it. And in order to defend it, what did we do? We raised interest rates. Okay. And, and, and here we are in the middle of this. <laughs> you know, we this tremendous. We would uh, never do uh, this right now. And, but. and so as you pointed out earlier, I guess you can point again to uh, when Roosevelt started to spend or right. uh, de develop some public projects, things started to right here. get a little better. In 1932, uh -huh. you, you see industrial production starting to go up. And again, it's the same thing as we saw with with unemployment. Everything is, is going better and then there's, a, in 1937 he loses his nerve mm -hmm. and industrial production, as, long, uh, as unemployment goes up, industrial production goes down, GDP goes down, and Roosevelt gets, gets a, a lesson in reality, goes back to doing what he had been doing with, the, with the, all those stimulus packages and then we have something that really takes off in say 1939 when Hitler's starting to invade uh, I guess Czechoslovakia country. and right. Poland in 1939, and then 1940, and then take it away. Well, yeah, it really actually, what's that. happening even in 1939, the British uh, start buying an awful lot of airplanes from us, uh, P-40s. They buy right. as much as we can produce. The war in Europe is starting. And so this starts to develop our productivity and starts bringing in, actually, they were paying us with gold, as a matter of fact, for that, and it was stimulating our economy. But when we got into the war, when you see 1940 here, and it peaks like this, this is a spectacular change, and there's a reason that happened uh, that's often not commonly known. Um, what happened here, the reason this tremendous spike was a young economist by the name of John Kenneth Galbraith was put in charge of a brand new agency called the Office of Price Administration, the OPA. Yeah. And it was his job to reallocate resources in the economy away from consumer goods into producer and capital goods. Goods yep. that make goods. So they did that by rationing. And what they right. did was they developed this program of issuing ration coupons. To, they were red. I actually remember those coupons. <laughs> a little before <laughs> and, my time. Yeah. And uh, you got them from the post office. And you went there and you got so many of these a month according to how many members in your family uh, you had. Right. Or if you were single, you got so many a month. Mm -hmm. And then you could only buy things uh, buy the ration coupons along with the money and you couldn't really spend all the money that you had because you couldn't buy goods. You actually had to stand in line for your mother to buy nylon stockings or even bread sometimes you had to stand in line for. But what that did, it reallocated a tremendous amount of resources from consumer goods to producer goods yes. and we had a triple rise in the industrial production index in two and a half years. Yeah. Um, Tremendous. So when yeah. we got into the war, if, uh, if uh, General Motors was able to uh, make, uh, let's say, 100 uh, Chevrolets a week or something or other, right. uh, when we got into the war in these peak times, they could make 300 tanks a week. And so this was a tremendous yeah. recovery based on productivity is what happened. Yeah. And so therefore, um, when the war ended, well, people were in good shape, even though it came down a little bit in 1946 here because we weren't... Well, post-war. Yeah, it wasn't crucial to get these things out. Right. Nevertheless, the economy was way up here at the this point, level. Yeah, the point is that we're really, we've, we've built all this capital up. Right. You know, all this, all this fixed capital to do the machine tools and all this kind of stuff. And so even though we have a dis, you know, we have to come da back down because we're not producing war material, we're we still have there. all the basics. Here. Yes, exactly. We got rich, and keep in mind, not one bomb hit the United States. This wasn't simply full employment. They were fully employed in England and fully employed right. in Germany. Yeah. 
Well, the uh, unemployment here was about 2% yeah, in the, in, during the war. But the key is that none of our resources were destroyed. Not one bomb right. hit the United States. So here is this Except enormous, for Hawaii. Yeah, yeah except this, uh, well, which wasn't part of the United States back then. Ah. Uh, but uh, here's this tremendous wealth. Now, when the war ended, people um, not only had this amazing productivity in the economy, they also had money that they had saved up. They weren't able to spend saving. during the war. And yeah. the soldiers came home and they had money. And, and the soldiers were also trained in skills. They weren't just off the farm anymore. They, they actually learned skills. Most of the, the soldiers in the war were not assault troops. They were actually support troops who learned skills. Yeah. So this was a tremendous boost that happened. Uh -huh. And that's how we got out. We started to get out a little bit, but as you say, uh, Franklin Roosevelt lost his nerve. Well, well this is the mother of all stimulus packages <laughs> this in a is, way. This is huge productivity, yeah. uh, just unprecedented. So that's, that's how you get out. I wanted to make one, one point yeah. before we move on to the next slide, is yeah. that how big this investment really was in terms of how much the American government was spending. At the peak, the American government was spending roughly 40% of GDP. Wow. And so wow. that, I mean, we're talking about, when we're talking about a stimulus package down in <laughs> here, we're talking 2 to 3% of but GDP. that's not just spending, that's investing. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's not just spending, it's but not it's... not consuming. I mean, I know John Maynard Keynes talked to Franklin Roosevelt, and uh, he made a point, something that I look at with a very <laughs> jaundiced eye. Uh, Fra he told Franklin Roosevelt, well, you can simply, if you want to, uh, just pay people to dig holes in the ground and fill them up again. And as long as you pay them, that's fine. Uh, Keynes came from this idea of demand-side economics, stimulate spending, but this is supply side economics. Well, it's both. It's well, both demand and supply because you're controlling, you're yeah. controlling the demand in a way, but you also have a huge demand built up because of the war material. Well, that's right. Yeah, you, you've actually created the base for potential demand that's enormous, enormous. And at the same time, you've gone supply side. John Kenneth Galbraith, exactly. a, a very liberal economist, not known for being a supply sider. He's a smart guy. But he was in those days. Uh, he later became ambassador to India, as I recall. Uh, Very okay, famous. Okay, so as we uh, move on and we go to um, percentage of unemployment, let's go to now. We've looked now at uh, the Great Depression and the lesson that I hope we've learned from at it. At least a little bit. I want to uh, also uh, go back to Aristotle here for a moment uh, in our general approach on, on, in this series is um, Aristotle said, it is first necessary to know what is before being capable of considering what ought to be. And that's the approach we take as part of the economic action group of the San Gabriel uh, Community for Change that we belong to. We wanna look at things as, as objectively as we can to find out what's going on, what's the reality. From there, then we can decide, oh, well, if this is real, then these options open up. You know, that, that's kind of the approach we have. We, we yep. don't really come to this program with an agenda. We, we go and look to see what we can see. So you're going to see things that if they're politically interpreted, they might look um, more toward a liberal on one hand, they might look more toward conservative in another. Reality is our, is our uh, major concern here. So uh, coming to the present, 2006 to 2009, um, this is um, a projection made by an independent organization uh, listed here, the bottom, and uh, it's not looking good at all. I mean, they're, they're projecting we're going to hit 9% unemployment uh, by May of 2009, yeah. and it gets worse. I mean, uh, I think there are reasons that uh, all over the world, really, everybody is gravely concerned right now that this is the worst crisis since the Great Depression. And we're going to see a little bit more about why we had the boom that created this. Right. Um, we can show uh, the next one, I think, is a little more specific. Jan, you might explain. This, is, right. this was uh, Christina Romer, by the way, who did this right. Yes. And she is uh, the new chair of... Um, the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Anyway, she, she's a doctorate from um, uh, originally MIT. She was at Princeton, now she's at Berkeley. Uh, is supposed to be an authority on depressions. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know much about her in that regard. Well, so is our Fed chief. Yeah, that's from Volcker, right. We'll get to Well, him. Bernanke. <laughs> oh, Bernanke, the one we have, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so you might want to explain that. Right, this is, mm -hmm. this is sort of a combination of, this is really projections. It's what 
mm-hmm. what we what Christina Romer and her her colleagues think would happen either with or without the stimulus package that we're going to be talking about a little bit later. This is the curve that you see here, the higher curve is the one without the stimulus package and it shows that the the effects of this depression I think we could, I think it's fair to call it a depression because it sure looks like one. <laughs> uh, well, because it looks of the, like of, we're getting of what it's what it caused yeah. what caused it. It's, it was it was created by a boom. It well, very yeah, and I'm going to get to that, but certainly the, the steepness of this curve I've never seen anything like this in right. decades. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, as you're saying, uh, uh, without the stimulus package, you're up there, and that's the same point. What she's got is the same as the independent study uh, around nine right. percent without the stimulus. So. Are we back to what Galbraith did in the 1940s with regard to stimulus and that's why you get more productivity? What's going on? That's a good question. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer that, but I can, I can tell you that this is not the only projection. There are projections that are worse than this. Uh-huh. Um, there, yeah. <laughs> there are projections that project that if we do nothing, that this will continue up and we'll hit, we'll hit 12%. Yeah. And that's, that, that is a very scary number. We're talking almost Great Depression numbers there. Yeah. In fact, uh, we'll see a little bit later uh, based on Sweden, which is a, an example very similar. Uh, yes, with that's right. Very similar causes to what we're facing. That's right. And that's what they had. They had 12 and the government acted right away and they still had 12. And they had a depression that lasted three years. That's right. Um, okay. well, the, but the point here is that if we do implement the kind of thing that, um, that President Obama is talking about, which is a stimulus package that has a combination of investment and tax cuts. Mm-hmm. Um, those that combination of things actually is t- hopefully will abort this so that it doesn't get in anywhere near what the kind of numbers that we're talking about and starts to turn over relatively quickly. Now, this may be optimistic. Yeah. We talked about this before. Now, is that what some people would call spending or is it productivity or both? We're talking here. Uh, some well, let's not. Spending is a almost a pejorative term in politics mm-hmm. today. You you don't want to. It's it's. You know, the if, tax I buy, and spend if I buy liberals, a new car, that's spending, right? Right. But <laughs> okay. if we and, and, but if but if I pay you to to build a bridge, ah, then that's, that's investment. It's investment. Okay. All right. So, but you may with your money that I pay you with go buy a car. Yeah. So then I've, we've done both. Exactly. Okay, so um, this is... And that's is, the multiplier effect. This is what apparently uh, Christina Romer is projecting um, with regard to what she thinks might happen with a stimulus. And it's, and it's uh, both sides of the aisle, actually. Be, we're going to look at a, an advisor to John McCain. That's right. Uh, Mark Zandi, and uh, see what he projects. Um, okay, so now uh, this is an interesting chart. <laughs> um, <laughs> Look at how smooth things are going here in terms of deficit. Here is the federal deficit. Uh, The dark line is a little more because it includes um, uh, deficit funds that the federal government actually holds itself. But they're basically very similar. Look how smooth everything goes here from uh, for decades on and on and on until we get um, almost to late 70s, early 80s something like that, and then suddenly skyrocket. Yeah. Now, this means spending. This means government spending. And to let well, everybody- Well, deficit know, means, not just means government spending, yeah. but it's possible that, that government intake was is inactive, being reduced. Was, it was being reduced, right. So they ran a big deficit. Uh, what we're gonna see though, that uh, money went up enormously, and we'll see that Well, shortly. both of those things happen. Yeah. We know where this happened yeah, we know, right there. We know. <laughs> so uh, this, this chart actually shows um, whose administration, uh, during whose administration various things were happening. Right. And um, it, it, the deficits keep going down as a percentage of uh, gross domestic product, and it's kind of following this. Uh, this is the level of deficit, but the economy is getting more productive, too. So the deficit uh, as a percentage of GDP is actually going down. It's looking really good. Until we get here, uh, sorry to say, uh, Reagan Bush, what happened here, Ronald Reagan had a budget director by the name of David Stockman, who did warn about this in public, and he said, um, in order to get out of stagflation, which existed in the Carter administration, we had double-digit interest rates, we had gasoline lines, but uh, Stockman pointed out, he said, well, uh, what they tried first, by the way, was um, a trickle-down, they tried... um, the Arthur Laffer curve with the, the idea curve. of cutting taxes for the very rich. I was a big fan of this. I was at USC at the time, and uh, I, 
I thought, this is going to be great. And uh, the idea was to stimulate the economy by cutting taxes for the rich. They would invest. Um, this would cause a multiplier effect, which would trickle down and stimulate the economy. It was called Reaganomics One, is what that was called. Right. And it failed. And uh, Utterly. Ross Perot, uh, years later, uh, about eight years later, uh, actually showed charts on, on how and why it failed. But Ronald Reagan had another agenda, too. He wanted to um, engage the Soviet Union in an arms race. He wanted to uh, bankrupt them in this arms race. That and was the he strategy. wanted spending, and he wanted to stimulate the economy. And so David Stockman warned, well, we can do this, but we're going to triple the national debt in five years. And in fact, that happened. And so here it goes. And it continued with George H.W. Bush. And then it went on. But then it turned around when Bill Clinton came in. What he did was he raised taxes um, for very rich people. Most people didn't see those taxes, but the I very didn't. rich did. I didn't see them, but very rich people did. And um, he balanced the budget, actually. did better than that. He had a $132 billion surplus. Amazing. Then this is a projection. This was a projection done last year for George W. Bush. And uh, this projected that he was going to have a uh, deficit of about $380 billion. But um, because of the crash that happened uh, in 2008, uh, the latest data indicate that um, W. Bush has a deficit of around a trillion, something like that. So it's going to be a curve. What a lovely way legacy. Up, way up there. So that's kind of a history of what's going on by administrations. Uh, this right. surprises a lot of people who might be politically inclined uh, that, uh, you know, who was doing what and, right. and how did it go. But you can see that in the first part, I mean, everybody's doing reasonably yeah. well. Everybody did well. Both parties, no yeah. problem. Yeah. Uh, and zoom, there it goes. And yes. we're going to see the money increase because right. this was supported right. by my old mentor, Alan Greenspan. That's right. And he was there. See, we're going to see why. And Paul Volcker was there, too. That's right. Uh, he was, Volcker was there from 79 to 87. Yes. And um, so now let's look at what happened to money. Now this, oh dear. to me, is one of the most important displays that we've got. Um, this doesn't give a reference here, but this is from Wikipedia. And uh, basically, this is money supply. Now, when you go off any kind of standard, a precious metal standard or some kind of limit, it means that your central bank can create money, as much money as it wants. The treasury can borrow, and, and it does. Well, who creates money exactly? When does okay. that happen? Well, let's look at the kinds of money. Right. A lot of people think that money is just the currency in our pockets. Not so. Currency in our pockets is this green one down here. And look at how small that That's is hardly compared anything. with everything right. else. That's called M0, by the way, in the vernacular. Um, but look at this money supply, and it's, you know, uh, total money, this rest of this money, M1, M2, and M3, those are commercial bank uh, deposits of various types. But what happens with the Federal Reserve, and I'm not going to get too technical in this one, but basically what happens is um, money is created through the banking system. Whenever anybody borrows anything through the banks, actually money is created and it's supported wow. by the Federal Reserve. It's done by accounting journal entries, uh, strokes of pens. It is not done by printing presses, not at all. No, look that's just printing the green press part. Is very small. But look at this rise in the money. This is the boom. Mm -hmm. Now this is what supported those deficits. Mm -hmm. Alan Greenspan was right in there <laughs> uh, in the 70s and- uh, Yes. He was part of that. Volcker was part of that in 79. Volcker was there through 1987. And then, um, I'm sorry, Volcker was before Alan Greenspan, I should say. Yes. It was Volcker, um, 79 to 87. And then Greenspan came in at 87. And boy, there it goes. Yeah. Now this, uh, according to uh, people like Benjamin Anderson, Murray Rothbard, uh, most economists, Peter Schiff in today's world, will say this is what's causing the underlying cause of the, the boom and the depression risk that we may in fact be in. Um, the idea that you have hucksters and people who take advantage and aren't properly regulated, that's another aspect. That's, that's very true. part of what enables this mechanism. Yeah, this mechanism. This mechanism lets them come in and create all these derivatives. And don't forget, and don't forget all the Chinese money and Saudi Arabian money, the oil money that's coming in at the rate of, I don't know, $5 trillion a year but or this something. Is, this is our money, though. This well, is our money supply. But it's, it's, but, that, but it's getting converted to our money supply because, again, remember that boom is coming from real estate, 
yeah. from loans that have been commoditized and cut and sliced and diced. So the name of this game anyway is there's too much money. And the way right. I experienced this, by the way, real life situation, when I went to college uh, at USC, my tuition for a whole year, private university, was the cost of a summer vacation. That's what it cost me to go to school. Anybody could afford to go to school at that time to go to college. It really could. Uh, today, if, uh, if even uh, my daughter, uh, who started off at UCLA, uh, the cost is half of an average person's annual salary. Um, a cost of, of, of a car was in the same kind of proportions. Uh, it was not the proportions that we have today. And the reason for this is that all this increased money was, was created by debt, which drove prices up. And that's why mm -hmm. prices are so high today. That's why it costs a fortune to send somebody to college. That's why a home that, um, that maybe you bought it in 1970 for $40,000 and today it should be worth 60,000 in the peak before the 2008 crash, uh, that home was 700,000. You know, th this kind of yeah. debt push of prices is the right. same thing that happened in the Roaring Twenties, caused by this enormous monetary increase. I can't stress this enough, and it was the good old Federal Reserve that was behind this. <laughs> anyway, um, back to the next one. On to the next one, let's look at some key Obama economic advisors. Um, Jan, you've pointed out one of them already. The only one I know anything about is Christina Romer, and you've already told, uh, told everybody who she is. Yeah. Um, you might know more about her than I do. Uh, but anyway, Austin Goolsby, uh, he is a longtime associate of Barack Obama. Uh, they go back a long time. He's from the uh, University of Chicago. He's yes. known as a centrist kind of economist. Mm -hmm. um, he is going to, he's going to be the chief um, economist of the Economic Recovery Board, and the, that board is chaired by a six foot eight inch tall Paul Volcker, <laughs> who was a Federal Reserve Chairman before Alan Back in Greenspan, the day. and Paul Volcker is generally recognized to be the most successful Federal Reserve Chairman in history. Uh, before Volcker, it was, uh, I think, Arthur Burns, who had a terrible record of inflation. Yes. Um, before Burns, it was a guy named William McChesney Martin. Uh, it goes all the way back through history. Mm -hmm. But Volcker, I think, uh, is generally recognized as the most uh, successful. But he started to inflate, too, as we saw in the... Well, he had the before. courage, I think, and, and it took some courage to really, you know, look the inflation in the eye and say, we're going to... We're, we're going to raise interest rates, and we're going to raise them, and we're going to raise them until you break the back. Yeah, he did do that, though. He started to give way in the uh, late 80s, and, and we saw that in that early right. curve. That's right. Uh, Goolsby, though, now there are many advisors. I mean, there's a 15-member panel here, and then there's a, the, yeah. the, uh, uh, Christina Romer has a, a, a Council of uh, Economic Advisors. She has a staff. Uh, Volcker has a staff of very famous people from all kinds of different uh, backgrounds. Uh, I know Barack Obama wants uh, a lot of diversity, and uh, there are some complaints that this is slowing things down. It's kind of a Japanese approach. I, I, it's uh, Japanese well, like to have a lot of consensus. Even let's hope we don't get the Japanese result. <laughs> yeah, with a, with a lot of, they, they want everybody to agree before they take action, and, and uh, I think Barack Obama follows some of that. It kind of s slows things, but you know the theory is that you'll get uh, wiser choices. And uh, Goolsby, though, I think is one to watch because he goes back uh, with Barack Obama many years. And so we move on now to Sweden's economic recovery mm. example. This, this is one that all of the administration uh, economists and experts are looking point at. Point to this one. They yeah. don't talk about it too much. They've talked about it a little bit, but this is the model they actually look at a lot because Sweden had a very similar thing. Uh, uh, economic collapse driven by uh, financial collapse. Um, the government went in and actually bought, uh, they bought bad debts from banks, they bought loans from banks, they actually took over, I think, one of the they banks. They nationalized. Yeah, they nationalized and That's they finally, uh, they started selling it back eventually. And yes, I think it took, still a, own, they as you say, it took bank. a few years yeah, to, to get that. it took three years in the Depression. They still own one of the banks, I think. Yeah. They, they want the national uh, nationalization approach, but well, this is a going good that way example too. of what can happen. And, it, and this is, I know, what everybody's looking at. 
Um, they had a three-year depression from 1991 to 1993. They went, unemployment went from 3% to 12%, yeah. four times increase. So this is why people really sweat. This is why George W. Bush and Henry Paulson were saying, oh my gosh, we've got to act right away. We, you yeah. know, we, we were going out with a $380 billion deficit. It's going to be $1 trillion, but we've got to bail out all these companies or financial uh, uh, traders, uh, trading organizations. They were panicked based on uh, what they were looking at here that happened to Sweden, and I know they're still worried that we're really headed for this. Uh, so the government uh, spent... Uh, they, they, they bought and they invested about 4% of the annual GDP for three years. That's, yeah. that's what they did. 4%. That's what it takes. That's what it was, 4% of the GDP. But what's interesting, and you might want to comment on this, um, the final cost, that was their ah, initial yes. cost. You know, right. they put the money up to begin right. with, and oh my gosh, here goes all this money. But the productivity went up so that their net cost, due to the productivity, uh, was actually half that. It was yes, 2%. That's and right. I think you know something, Jan, about well, the Well, the multipliers are interesting in this uh, in this case. This one, basically, you're talking about a multiplier of roughly, uh, roughly two yeah. here. Um, there are many mechanisms which produce different, si different kinds of multipliers. They all all kinds of different uh, ways to calculate them. So they have a wide range of, of, of numbers that people can use. Um, and this one, actually, when you talk about what uh, the multiplying effect of, of an investment. Okay. Like, a, a, like the, the government says, okay, now I'm going to spend money to do build a bridge or do whatever it is. Not that dig a hole do. in the ground. Not dig a hole okay. in the ground. That's, um, okay. Well, there's, there's a multiplier there too. but it's, spending. Huh? Yeah, because, uh. because there's spending. But part of this is also what, what the Republican, I think, I'm not sure whether it was Republican or Democrat. There was a, there was a, a concept called dynamic scoring, mm -hmm. if you remember a ways back. And it was some of these things where you would con not consider just the cost, the upfront cost, but also the effect on the economy and the increase in the, the decrease in unemployment, mm -hmm. the, de the decrease in unemployment benefits required because people were being more employed, mm -hmm. the increase in salary because people were now employed, they could pay taxes. Okay. So, so all of these mechanisms give you money back. Okay. And so, so it does create, cost. A, it, there is a productivity there even on a spending basis. Even on just, a spending basis. Not just an investing basis. That's right. So that's how uh, a government um, investment program can actually uh, uh, bring the productivity up. Right? Because yes. there's a gap, apparently. Yeah. Okay, now let's look at uh, some more specifics here. The first phase of this package yes. um, is $350 billion, the first phase of it. And it's broken down like this. You can see uh, it's alphabetical here, but the, uh, the largest one is right here is aid to the states. That's $79 billion. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the things that got changed in the Senate bill, okay. actually, a different thing from the down. House. Okay. That's, uh, that's greatly reduced, okay. unfortunately. Okay. Um, there's transportation and byways. That's roads, bridges, you know, and you know, mass transit. Classic all that. infrastructure. Classic infrastructure. That's $71 billion. That's another really big one. Yep. Uh, the energy is big, but it's not as big as these. It's $54 billion. Broadband is only $6 billion. That's right. uh, some of these are looking into the aim of these things is to increase American productivity. I time. think that's uh, if you're talking about alternative energy, yeah. there's a lot of, of things in the out years for that. This, it's more of an upfront. Uh, we have there's some immediate immediate things, but there's also some investment in the future, some investment in research, some investment in development, uh, some uh, there's money for companies to do, you know, advanced research, advanced work. Yeah. to try to do better and, and get some more in alternatives. Okay, and then there's water treatment, uh, flood control, environments uh, 19, there's, there's some others here. Well, education's uh, large, 62 billion. Yeah, education is large, 62 billion. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that at the end of the program. Um, it's not all education, or, well no, I'm sorry, it's uh, healthcare is the one I'm gonna talk about. Now this yes. is healthcare systems, this is not about uh, insuring everybody. <laughs> no, this is about universal healthcare. This is about automating and electronic having electronic records, right? So you don't have to tell your doctor every every, every doctor you come to all the information. Right, right. Uh, Pre-existing conditions and all that. Business. All that stuff. Right. Uh, science. Uh, it, it could have been bigger. It's only ten billion. 
I wish that the Super Collider were part of this package. That's because, gonna be tough, but. Uh, if we had the Super Collider, uh, America could once again take the lead in particle physics. Right now it's happening in Europe with CERN, with the Large Hadron. But if we had the Super Collider, we fired it up again, we could be the first to discover what gravity is, uh, to mention among many things. Uh, we could do more nanotechnology, we could do enormous things. I wish there were more money in science than there is. So I, my own opinion is that this is a rather modest package, well, actually. Uh, you should probably think, uh, you should probably say how big the shortfall in demand really is. Yeah. I mean, this package is not, does not fill that void. Well, the value of houses alone, the total housing value in the United States after the collapse right. is $20 trillion. Yeah. Now, there was something like a $5 trillion collapse of housing values. Yeah. So when you're talking those kinds of money, I mean, you know, $5 trillion, you suddenly collapse in value in the economy. You're talking about not even $1 trillion here. And that's, that's right. See, our economy is based, uh, Jan, on two major things, houses and cars. <laughs> That's what it's about. Now, this is reallocating resources a little bit like what happened in World War II, not to the conventional consumer. You know, I mean, a house is a consumer thing. Yes. A car is a consumer thing. Right. This is infrastructure. Capital. This is capital, goods, yep. investment and productivity. This is similar to what happened in World War II kind of thing. But without the rationing. That's right, without the rationing, without the war. Right. And uh, so when you've got um, this kind of uh, money allocated and you lose $5 trillion of, of housing value alone, not to mention the rest of the economy, right. uh, believe it or not, this is, uh, this is modest. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the shortfall in, um, I guess, it, the missing capacity, right? There's, the economy has a certain capacity of producing right. a GDP. And, where we're, we're, we're about $2 trillion shy of that you're capacity. Getting, you're getting very close to, I'm uh, going to bring this up. Uh, yeah, well, gee, I missed it on the last slide, but I had um, a display on there that showed that it went, uh, that we really have a 2 to $3 trillion potential need yes. for uh, stimulus, actually. That's the, right. The, the administration is not saying that. Uh, certainly. Uh, well, actually, they did. He did. I, did he I did that? contradict you. Uh, I actually, uh, uh, Obama did say that, that we were facing a, a $2 trillion over the next two years, and it could be as high as three, uh, which is, which is well, when your you number. Well, you lose $5 trillion in housing alone, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this is, this is the potential. Now, this pie chart is simply a distribution visually based on the figures in the previous right. uh, display, and you can see uh, state aid was a lot. Um, well, Oh yeah, science I should say itty bitty. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> down here, water in a, uh, a flood control environment. Uh, energy yeah. is is substantial, and that's good. Education is. is I want to talk a little bit about about energy, and that there's there's an infrastructure bit here with with energy that is quite important. That's the advanced grid, the smart grid. Mm -hmm. If no matter what energy mix in the end, alternative energy mix we come up with in terms of wind or solar or solar or solar heating, or uh, geothermal, or whatever, whatever mix it is, maybe nuclear, I don't know. Mm -hmm. we're, all, we're going to have to make the grid smart. We're going to have to increase the efficiency of the grid and be able to you know, buy and sell power more quickly, more efficiently. Um, and the technology is here. It exists. We just have to implement it. That's a major problem, I understand, too, because uh, I read some data about if we had a hundred mile by hundred mile square mm -hmm. of solar panels that could be easily placed in the state of Nevada, yep. that would be enough to power all industrial requirements in the United States. Yep. But the power, the problem is you can't get we it. can't distribute it. Right. The grid isn't there. Exactly. And that's part of what this investment will talk about a real good capital investment for the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best ones around in this in unless this group. we individually put up our own solar panels that's not as efficient uh-huh um, really the other thing is the other thing I wanted to mention here um, let me see is is state is states aid uh-huh um, we talk about um, immediate aid remember Barack Obama's talked about let's get let's get those jobs in the next you know year or so yes um, state aid is one of the quickest ways to save jobs okay um, well, I want to move to the next slide. Let's yes. see. Um, yes, productivity will cut the deficit. Well, we've been talking about this. Exactly. Um, net federal debt addition 
is much less than the cost of the plant. Now, this information comes from Moody's economist Mark Zandi. Now, Mark Zandi is a conservative who was an advisor to John McCain. So again, um, political postures and orientations, uh, as far as we're concerned in this program, mean nothing. Uh, we're interested in who's got a grip on reality. And Mark Zandi came up with this. He says uh, an $800 billion recovery plan could produce uh, $3.1 trillion over the next uh, four years in terms of productivity, four times the cost, a lot more, That's actually a, much more uh, optimistic than Christina Romer. Yes. And so he's saying, gee, you put up less than a trillion now, you get three trillion back in productivity later. That's pretty amazing if he's right. Uh, now he's saying that the gross domestic product will be about a trillion dollars higher, both in 2010 and, uh, I'm sorry, 2011 and 2012, um, if this package is implemented. So if, and, and here we practically can read it, if Zandi's uh, GDP estimates are anywhere close to correct, uh, then the net fiscal cost would be very modest. Well, it actually might be the other way. Might actually we might have be, a gain. Might have a gain. Yeah. And due to the higher tax revenues, because you get all this extra productivity, then you get more tax revenue, yep. that reduces your deficit. And so therefore, um, you, have a, 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 you have a better tax revenue base and you have lower deficits than you would have had without the stimulus package, which is interesting. It's a paradox, but there it is. And this is, this is both sides of the aisle talking here. Yeah, that's uh, right. So we get back to economic solutions. Uh, we're, we're getting to the point that maybe uh, this stimulus package that is up right now looks like a lot of money, but in terms of productivity, it actually might be quite modest. And okay, you corrected me that Barack Obama actually did say uh, two trillion or so. That's right. Well, that was my independent view that it was gonna be two to three trillion, right. just looking at, at collapse of values. And that's mm -hmm. not to say that all prices should remain high. The, the name of this game, I don't wanna have no. to see a, an average person's, half of that person's salary supporting a child in, in just a tuition for a year in college. Well, it's you clear know. that house prices cannot stay where they are. Exactly. And so, so these prices do have to come down. But part of what we're going to be doing in our series uh, in future programs, we're going to show how we can aid the individual and the family yeah. in, in order to weather this storm, not just the big guys and the big producers and everything else right. and to save the economy in general, we're going to talk about how do you get one through one of these economic depressions to where everybody can do it, even if the prices do come down, can you then afford to send your kids to school, can you afford right. health care, um, uh, so many things that, that yeah. uh, are so expensive today, housing is so terribly expensive, that debt is what drove those prices up. And I do hold the Federal Reserve accountable for that, and our government, and certainly Mr. Volcker, is not talking about that. Um, okay. Well, recommendations. Well, based on what we've looked at, <laughs> you could read the top The one. first one is very clear, I think. <laughs> Implement some sort of, of a plan like the Obama plan. I'm sure the House and Senate will come to some sort of understanding about it, and it should be very close to what we see now. Okay. Uh, and my position on this, the uh, uh, Federal Reserve is largely responsible, uh, created the monetary basis for this boom that has caused this bust. We cannot have this if we want to prevent these kinds of things of, re uh, of recurring. We saw this happen in the roaring 20s and mm -hmm. the crash in Great Depression. It was 62% right. increase in the money supply. Uh, we, had a, we had hundreds of percent increase in the money supply this time. That graph that we looked at earlier, yes, that's when right. you saw that steep curve that just went just like this, yes. far more drastic than the 1920s uh, monetary increase. That's right. So based on that, um, my view is we do need to get back to a gold standard after we do all this major recovery mm -hmm. spending. But you're not talking about an international gold standard no, I'm here, talking where, about, where you would be, where we, you know, no, just we don't want to do that States. again. That no, was no, a bad, just, just that was the a bad United idea. States. What I'm talking about is peg our money to gold. That's what okay. I'm saying. Uh, 
to put a lock on the Federal Reserve from being able to create unlimited amounts of money mm -hmm. through uh, bank credit. I think we're not d completely done with that, though. I mean, there's there's more regulation that's going to be needed in terms need of regulation. Th because there were some real excesses. Yes, in this. there were. We need regulation. There's no question about that. Um, I want to see more of that. Uh, I want to lock down the Federal Reserve. I do hold them accountable for this, even though there were all the hipsters and all of the derivatives and everything else that took advantage of selling the same house and package of homes the 10 times. Uh, you know, after the first time, it was valueless, really. Yeah. Uh, so that, that needs to quit, and regulations need to be put in place. But I, uh, people like uh, Ron Paul uh, and Peter Schiff take a very jaundiced view, and I believe justifiably so, at the Federal Reserve's role in this and the fact we should get back to at least a gold-backed money system in the United States, uh, similar to what happened in the 1930s where maybe 35% of your money has to, be in, has to be represented by gold. It doesn't mean you're trading it, mm -hmm. but it has to it has to lock that money supply. I think in. that happened. That we were, we left that in about 1931 or 32, actually. Uh, actually, we never completely went off the the gold backed money mm. until uh, Richard oh, yes, Nixon. Oh yes, that's right, Richard, Richard Nixon. Nixon. That's right. Uh, and then Lyndon Not, Johnson uh, got rid of silver. You know. Yes, And, and, and that's then that right. was that was the final deal. So right, right. my view is. We have to discipline the Federal Reserve. There's no way to do it legally, in my opinion. It never happens. So I'm advocating return to gold, but only after quite a number of years. I, mean, first I think we, have we to need to recover this from this. We need to recover first, and I'm in agreement that we need to implement the Obama plan immediately. Um, I have one reservation the Obama plan doesn't show on this slide, Right. but uh, the Obama plan calls for $100 million of um, aid to faith-based um, uh, charities. And uh, first of all, that is uh, contrary to separation of church and state. And um, if there were any aid to be administered by faith-based uh, organizations, my uh, requirement would be that they can't get any money out of this themselves directly at all. They have to do this on a voluntary Right. humanitarian basis just as they normally operate. I wonder, uh, do you have the statements? I have, have this, made? yeah, that um, this, I'm going to read this because yeah. I want to get it right. Yeah. Um, this is, uh, well, the, the beginning is, is, the first one is from Thomas Jefferson, a letter to Danbury Connecticut Baptist Association where he says, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. That's is, where the wall of separation idea came this from. This is the establishment okay. clause. All right. Okay. And the second quote is from James Madison, a letter from 1803 objecting to the use of government land for churches. And I can see how this is important. The purpose of separation of church and state is to keep forever from these shores the ceaseless strife that has soaked the soil of Europe in blood for centuries. Okay, they felt Ooh. very strongly about this, and of course the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights is about uh, having That's no right. law that uh, enacts any kind of uh, government religion or state of religion, as That's well right. as freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Yes. Also, um, Article 6, Section 3 of the Constitution calls out there shall be no religious test for holding public office in the United States. That's right. So even if, uh, so if CNN wants to interview some uh, candidate, uh, technically they're not even supposed to ask that candidate what their religious background is because that could constitute a test. But anyway. <laughs> uh, I don't only, think that would stand up in court. Well, but. it's the Constitution. It's Article <laughs> yeah. 6, Section 3. Yeah. But, uh, but what, my, it, what constitutes a test is the, is the question. But my point is, uh, if any faith-based organization, $100 million, uh, my point, my requirement would be that they don't get one penny of this themselves in terms of compensation, that they would only administer it and then it might, uh, it might work. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way it works out. Maybe that's the way it works out. If it didn't go that way, I'd want that money to go to the Super Collider. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, Give I think, uh, you have any more comments? No, I think that's, 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 that covers it for me. Okay, I think we've provided uh, a definition of what the key problems are in the crisis we have today. We did arrive at, uh, what do you know, stimulus package does look good. It doesn't matter which party it is. Mm -hmm. We can see why George Bush administration started it. And, right. why and it worked, going on. and it worked, and it did something back in the Great Depression. Yes, and, except they, like you pointed out, they lost, lost their, their nerve, nerve and it took World War II where we had this tremendous spike.
So anyway, um, we hope that uh, everybody uh, will have enjoyed this program, and uh, we hope you'll look in on us next time. Thanks very much. Thank mm-hmm. you.